So I've been looking through the ideas that I've been putting together for our team for this fall to see which ones would fit with what you do. And we have different event descriptions, and we have the, the way that they break down the barriers between the different kinds of interpretation events, those are different. And so really a lot of the ideas that I've come up with for our own people just wouldn't fit the way you do your events. But I have two possibilities for persuasive speech topics, and then there's one duo that if you're willing to do a little bit of digging, it's interesting, you'd have to cut quite a bit of it out, but you'd be left with something that I think probably would work for your judging pool and for the way that your event plays out. But let me talk about the persuasive topics first. In, at the end of April, in the April 29th, 2010 issue of Business Week, there was this really intriguing short news article that referred to a number of different research studies to make the argument that sitting down, just sitting down, is unhealthy. And it, it said, don't make the mistake of thinking that doing a lot of sitting down is unhealthy just because it means you're not exercising and you wind up obese and with heart disease. That does happen to a lot of people, but, but that's not what this research says. It says independently of having a sedentary lifestyle, the amount of time you spend sitting down is itself associated with health risks. And it then goes on to say that most of our chairs are designed exactly wrong for our spines. And instead of having something that makes us sit up straight, the S-curve in our spine means that we should actually have a chair that leans back at a pretty severe cant. Now, it is the case that, from what I hear, the way persuasive speaking works in your league is that you take something that's kind of a headline-grabbing, societal-level social problem, like drug use, like abortion, like uh, overseas adoptions, things like that, and you give a persuasive speech that here's the problem and here's the solution. But one thing that I, I remember back when I competed in high school, and most people did speeches on those kinds of topics, the few people that would really pick a topic that the people in the room could act upon, that really was more of an individual change, when they could do that and do that well, they could break out of what was expected in the event, and they could be very successful with it. So if it's really kind of neat, because when you get up to give that speech, there are a lot of people in the room who are there who are sitting down and you can refer to what they're doing. And you have to be kind of careful with the way you did it, but you might even, in the middle of the speech, invite everyone in the room to stand up and challenge them, maybe, to be audience members for your speech for the rest of the round and for everybody else's speech standing up. And tell them along the way, here are the health benefits if you were to choose to do so. And that might fall flat on its face, but it's also occurred to me, and this is something I'm going to talk about with my own team members, if you made that invitation and nobody wanted to stand up, you could then say, see, now that is the root of the problem. We are so trained to sit down that when we're confronted with the evidence that sitting down is doing us damage, we still don't want to act on it. So that could be really, maybe possibly a way of magnifying the problem that you described to the people in the room. That's one topic, the dangers of sitting down. And if you go to that article in Newsweek, you'll find that it gives you enough information about this research being done at various other places. One of them is uh, by a researcher by the name of Mark Hamilton, who's at the University of Missouri. And that name sticks in my mind because one of my team members is named Mark Hamilton, and I may see if he's the one who wants to do the speech. But there's enough information in that that you should be able to track down everything else you need to put the speech together. The other topic that I have my eye on, and it came from an article that I just read while I was kind of filter feeding on the internet a couple of weeks ago, was how many people have misunderstandings about drowning and about the particular danger of drowning. And by this, I am not referring to things like, you know, knowing that you can drown in shallow water, especially if you're a small child, because most people do get that. But the differences in drowning risk between salt water and fresh water, the after drowning effect, that even after you've pulled someone out of the water and they're fully conscious and walking around, that does not mean they're out of danger and they've got to go to the emergency room. And in particular, and I'm probably going to get the term wrong, Oh, let me look at this, my cheat sheet here. Instinctive drowning response. A lot of people have, from having watched cartoons when they were a kid, or from seeing, seeing drowning depicted in movies, they had this idea that drowning, you're only drowning if you're splashing in the water, if your arms are going up and down splashing, and if you're yelling for help. That's what drowning looks like. And that's the image most people carry around in their head, the prototypical drowning. And here's a really scary number, because of instinctive drowning response, when you really are drowning, your arms go down, they push, they push at the water, and it does not look to bystanders like you're drowning. And when you're drowning, 
you're fighting for air, and it makes it virtually impossible to yell. And here's the really chilling number that made me think this could be a really powerful, like a wrecking ball powerful speech. Drowning is the number two cause of death for small children, and by some numbers, up to 10% of children drown while their parents are watching them and do not know that they're drowning. Now, imagine putting that particular bit of information across to your audience, and you set it up as a problem-solution speech. But the problem is, the drowning claims a lot of lives, and in particular it claims a lot of lives because people don't understand the nature of the danger, and worse, they think that they do, but much of what they know is wrong, which is a great justification for you giving that speech to set them straight. And the solution is to just take a few simple precautions, chief of which is know what you're looking at. Know what drowning really looks like. Be someone who can call other people's attention and say, that person's in trouble. Not only do we need to get them out of the water, but once we've got them out of the water, we've got to take them to the emergency room right away for further treatment because of the additive risks of drowning, even after you've got them back up on their feet and breathing again. So, those two possibilities for persuasive speech topics, the dangers of sitting and the dangers of not being informed on drowning. And it's possible that drowning might fit better into one of your expository or illustrated oratory topics, something that's more of an informative speech by nature. But I think you could make it work as a persuasive speech. Maybe you want to give that a little bit of thought. Last thing, one interp piece. And you would have to clean it up. It does in its original form, it has a fair amount of profanity in it, but the nice thing is, the profanity that's in there, all of it is easily removable. Sometimes you have a piece and it's just got so much profanity larded through it that if you took the profanity out, you would lose something. The piece would really not have any integrity left. And I usually put those aside. I mean, those are not the kinds of things that we want to present as the kind of literature that we believe in here at Northwest Christian. But here we have somewhere all the profanity is pretty much incidental and the, the name of the piece is 359, A Drag Race for Two Actors. It's by a playwright by the name of Marco Ramirez. And I'm thinking this guy has to have a background in forensics because he's done a lot of pieces that are for one actor or for two actors. A couple of years ago, one of my team members did a dramatic intert by him called I Am Not Batman, which was a 10-minute monologue for one actor. This guy's got to have forensics in his background. The place where I found it, uh, I can even show it to you, I found it in... The Actors Theater of Louisville, the Humana Festival, 2009, The Complete Plays, which looks like, uh, back it up, looks like that. So maybe you could get on Amazon and dig around and find you a copy of it. When you see it, when you see this piece, you'll see why I think this could be such a good duo. You'd really have to have split-second timing, the two actors, but the way, you could, you, the way you could block this and the way you could build the intensity of it, it could be the kind of thing that would be the talk of the tournament. So those are really, out of the ideas that I've generated over the summer, I think those are the ones that are probably going to come the closest to fitting what flies in your league. And because your league and my league deal with students who are at fairly different points in life, there are differences in what judges expect, but these things I think have some potential, so maybe you can check them out and find some use for this.